Welcome to Island Baptist Church's Bible study in the parables of Luke, Lesson 2. We're going to be in Luke 16. Now we're skipping around, not, not going necessarily in order. Um, I kind of did them as I came across them, more or less, and um, so it may seem like it's random, and the reason why it seems that way is because it is. <laughs> They're all good, and it's just kind of the way the way they came to me, and so I was just writing them. In fact, this is a Bible study I wrote a long time ago, and this is a revamped version of that, um, probably 2001 or two, something like that. We, I did this Bible study somewhere way back there, a hundred years ago. To me, I just, I don't know, I don't know about y'all, but to me, a two, I had a 2005 car that was, I had to, we had to get rid of it. I mean, it completely croaked, and everything was, everything went wrong. I'm thinking, 2005, that's, that's new. <laughs> No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Especially down here. So Luke 16, and we're going to be getting into uh, most of the, well, probably all of these parables we're going to be looking at are parables that you're very familiar with. We, we looked last time at, at the um, prodigal son, uh, the sheep, the, the lost coin. These are parables we've heard. I know I have heard them since I was a child. Um, but maybe never heard them in, the correct, in a fully correct way. We're going to be doing the same thing today. We're looking at the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus and uh, seeing what God has for us here. But let's, let's pray and just ask God's, um, of course, always help as we interpret his word. And God, we do humble ourselves before you. We thank you for your great grace, your mercy to us. Thank you for your kindness, God, and the way you've blessed us. Thank you for your word that you've given to us that gives us light, uh, gives us hope, gives us direction, Lord. I pray that we would follow that direction. I pray, Lord, that it would pierce uh, even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, just like you say that it does. And uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit would hold sway over this place, over our hearts, and that we be completely open to hear everything you have to say to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, as it was true for our other parables we looked at last time, this is going to be true for this one. Part of our, part of our um, shallowness of understanding of it is, is our culture. Uh, we interpret it from a position of our culture, uh, as Western people would, and we miss uh, the richness of what a Jewish man like Jesus would have been actually saying to Jewish ears who were the hearers. And again, as we said last time, if your interpretation of the Scriptures dip, differs from the original hearers, interpretation of it, you're probably, in fact, almost certainly wrong. And so to a certain degree, we're, we're wrong about a large piece, portion of Scripture, not, not, not large theological ideas, may, maybe so, but mostly just the, the richness of it because we don't have Jewish ears. And even if we did, we don't have Middle Eastern, first century Jewish ears. And so uh, that hampers us some. So here in chapter 16 is another chapter that is unique to Luke and the parables that Jesus told. And um, it could be titled many ways. We could call it, call it the reluctant, reluctant witness from hell. We could call it the great reversal. Uh, we could call it how to think you're going to heaven and end up in hell. That's actually not a bad, not a bad way because that's really the driving point here that Jesus is trying to communicate. Very important parable because most people in Western culture uh, have already been exposed to Christianity and thus understand that there is, or at least have some concept of heaven. And by the way, also believe that they're going there. So if I was in a, somewhere where we could gather the 300 million people here in the United States and have them all raise their hands and get an actual count of how many people believe there's a heaven, and then how many people believe they're going to heaven, it, it'd be around 90%. Now, is that true? I, I don't know. I, I hope that it is. I don't, I don't believe that it is, but I hope that it is. So, so let's just do our own little count here. How many of you believe there's a heaven? How many of you plan to go there? Other hand. <laughs> plan to go there? So here's a very important question. It's all searching. You plan to go to heaven, right? What's your plan? What's your plan? You got to have a plan. You say you got. I got a plan to go to heaven. I got no plan. You got no plan. You're not going to go there. I got. You know. I'm going on a trip, but I'm not getting in my car. Um, no, you're not. You're not going there. Can we agree that if our plan to go to heaven disagrees with God's plan to go to heaven, that we ain't going to heaven? Can we agree with that? 
You're not going to give. You're not going to give your terms to what is his, and you're not going to make it, as they say, a deal with the band upstairs. No deals. Either you get with the plan, or you get the alternative to the plan, the default to the plan, which of course is not heaven, as as in the case of this man, this this reluctant reluctant witness from hell can assure us. Uh, sincerity is the trump card that people throw out there, and uh, sincerity is not going to get you there any more than being sincerely sad about the crime you commit is going to get you off at a court up here in uh, uh, Cameron County. You're still going to be charged. You're still going to have to pay for it. So the time to be sincere is before you commit the crime, right? Well, uh, sincerity is not what gets people there. I had a man take me aside. I was, we were preaching on my second year of marriage. We were, first year of marriage, we went to Yellowstone. I preached all summer in the park there. And in the second year of marriage, we went to Smoky Mountain National Park, and we lived outside of Smoky Mountains and worked there. And then I would preach in one of the little concessions, the, the campgrounds. And I had a man after one of the services of, uh, come up to me angry because I said something about those who do not believe in Jesus are not going to heaven. He, he, he was angry. All sincere people, he said, go to heaven. And I just like, I wish that was true is what I told him. I said, I wish it was. But I said, I, I'm just telling you what it says. I, we don't get to decide what heaven's like and who goes there. It belongs to God. So we either submit to his program or we wind up in the default of a place. And hell, listen to me, and this may be a shocker to you, but I, I think you'll make more sense as we go. Hell is going to be populated mostly by people who are shocked to find themselves there. If we just took a sampling, again, of the United States, how many people plan to go to heaven? It'll be 90% or more. And are all those people going to go to heaven? I hope, but I don't think. And so the portion that's not, that think they are, are going to be shocked when they find out that they're in the other spot. Uh, here, here's another one just to add to that. People, hell's going to be popular by people who are shocked to, go, to find themselves in, in that place. Hell, hell is going to be populated, listen, mostly by religious people. That makes sense? By religious people. You, you know, atheism is, is a recent invention, like a past century and a half, really since the invention of the lie called evolution. Really, atheism hasn't, it didn't really exist prior to that. They, you know, the enlightened age or whatever, there was a few, but they were very rare. Mostly, including today, most of the world are religious people. They believe in some form of afterlife, some form of God, some form of teachings have some form of scriptures. They are all religious people. Muslims are religious people. Very, they're not, they have no concept of atheism. That's the first people they kill. <laughs> they're going to kill people. They understand someone like us who, has, who, who lives and abides every single day with a faith in a God. That's their system. Um, uh, Mormons are religious people. Uh, Hindus are religious people. I mean, we're talking about the majority of the world right now. If they all died, the majority of the people are religious. More of the people that have died in, in history have been religious people. The vast majority, 99.9%. Hell is going to be populated with religious people. It is. It really is. And so we've got to wrap our minds around that and, and get it straight. The, word is, the world is dominated by religious people, therefore hell is going to be dominated by religious people. There's spots up here. I wouldn't sit next to this man, but, but that man's not bad. <laughs> There are spots up here if you want to sit. There's uh, one there. No, you're fine. Paul's, Paul's not as bad as he looks. <laughs> a, you don't sit on the front, Paul. You just got to learn to not do that, man, because that's who I pick on. Remember last week, um, uh, the shocker of, of, of those, at least for the Jews, the story of uh, first of all, the two stories of, of course you would stories. Of course, the the lost coin would be found. Of course, the the lost sheep would be searched for, and you would leave the ninety nine. But that God would reach out and care was a shocker. That He would rejoice more over those than over those who don't need to be rescued was a shocker to them. Even though it was a part of the way they would do things, they wouldn't rejoice over the sheep that didn't run away. They would rejoice over the one that they found. The real shocker comes though, and and the thing that that really mess mess with them is that the other one that was saved in this story. Uh, actually, the biggest shocker is the, is the fourth person who isn't. But the, the third person who's saved in this story is, of course, the son who willingly, knowingly, knowing the father, turns his back on him, goes and completely um, uh, ruins his life and spins and mistreats and disrespects. And the fact that that son, because of repentance, 
Because he turns back to the Father, is rescued because the Father has mercy and grace upon him. That's a shocker. It really is. The, the real shocker, though, is the one who's closest to the Father who never repents. Among the 99 who need no repentance, like I said, have you ever known a person who needs no repentance? There's no such thing. But he thought he didn't. He was so close to the Father, but yet the story ends with him unreconciled. And by the way, when your story ends in this life unreconciled to the Father, it's going to stay that way forever. And it's going to be really bad for you there in that place. Hell is going to be populated by religious people. Watch Matthew 7, 21 and 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Do you call him Lord? A lot of people do. But not everyone who does will enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's not like a formula. It's not like a magic dust or anything. Only one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, many will say to me, and that mark it carefully, many religious people. Watch the religious stuff that they do. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? That's pretty religious. In your name, drive out demons? In your name, perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. So here's Jesus telling us right there, many are going to be in hell, not thinking they were going there, being themselves religious people. Very religious. For the most part, they're more religious than I, than I am. I, I mean, I've done maybe a little prophecy, but I've not driven out any demons or performed any miracles yet. So, very religious people. What we're going to read this morning is a story of a religious person who is, I should say, religiously approved person. Not necessarily religious himself, but they would have assumed he's religious based upon his wealth. Uh, who is shocked to find himself in hell. Another shocker of those who, who listened was, the, of course, this poor man who, who, who winds up in the opposite place. See, in their culture, they believed the rich were destined to heaven and the poor were already marked for hell. And so Jesus is, is going to flip the whole story on them, turn it over on them, because there's no relationship between what you're experiencing here on this earth necessarily and what you're going to experience in the next life. And this is a great illustration of that. Um, some, some say, and I don't know that I disagree with this, that this is not a parable. And what I mean by this is that parables are classified or classified in a category that's, among other things, that say there are no names in the parables. Almost every other, in fact, every other parable we're going to read, the people, the characters have no names. There was a father that he had two sons. You never get any names. In this case, because we, the king isn't named, but the poor man Lazarus is, makes people think that possibly Jesus was speaking to a situation that a number of people there were familiar with, an actual real-life situation. Now he's informing them about what happened after both these guys died. Now, I put that out there as a possibility. Can't prove it. Can't disprove it. But I, I want you to think with me for just a second about the, about the, about the situation of hell. What, what if everything in your life was as bad as it possibly could be? And let me put it this way. Take everything bad that has ever happened to you in your life, how you felt about it, your pain, disappointments, failures, hatreds, bitterness, Fear, anxiety, experience, all that, everything you've ever been through, and you, you got them sequentially, right? And they usually started and ended, and the next trial came, and the next problem, and all the, take all those and pile it on yourself right now, all at once. What would that be like? And, and include all that, all the hopelessness that came with it, and, and then make it a permanent fixture in your life, no matter what you uh, thought at the time, you know, those things came and went, but, but these, I want you to make this a permanent fixture, this, this experience of pain and trouble and anxiety and grief and all the issues of all the things that have ever happened. You put them all in your life and, and add to that that this is not going to end and it's never going to get better forever. Multiply that, I'd say exponentially, by profound physical torture. Torment, suffering, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, all at the same time with no relief forever. And you're beginning to understand what hell's going to be like. Hell is a place of complete consciousness. A reality not, over a, not only of what you are currently, but what you were and what you could have done or should have done. It's, it's, a place, it's a place of complete information. I don't believe, I can't necessarily prove this, although we may say... It's evident here. I believe it is partially evident in our story. I believe hell is going to be a place that's just as educated as heaven for the person. There's not going to, hell's not going to have a, heaven's not going to be more educated as far as what reality is, what experience is, who God is, any more than hell. Hell's going to know as much as heaven does. 
part of what's going to make it hell. Part of what's going to make it that. With, un, with the inability to change and, and experience the things and go back and, and reorder the things. And we have a story here that, that points us, I believe, in many ways in that direction. Hell is a place of most profound suffering, compounded infinitely with the fact that it lasts forever and ever and ever. There is no change. That's the place. I'm going to read a story about a man who went there. Let's read it. Chapter 16, verse 19. It says, now there was a certain rich man. He habitually dressed in purple and fine linen and gaily living in splendor every day. And a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming, licking his sores. So extreme situations here. Came about that the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So this is where the shocker starts. Jesus, most of his stories we're going to see were complete shockers to the people. And we're going to see why. Been a shocker to think that this guy would have gone there and that, that the, other, the rich man went the opposite direction. Came about the poor man died and was carried away the angels, by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in this plane. How, how horrible must it be that a drop of water on your tongue can make all the difference in, in the world for you? What, what is that like? We have no concept. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received good things, and likewise Lazarus, bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. No remedy. Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over from here to you may not be able, and that none may cross over from here to us. And he said, then I beg you, since there's no relief for me, I beg you. No, notice he's from hell. He's a missionary. Like I said, I think hell's going to be the same as, same as heaven as far as knowledge. People need to be reached for Jesus, right? He's deciding in hell. People need to know the truth of God from hell. Yeah, that's something you should have known down here, but it's too late. He said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest also they come to this place of torment. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, which is what? The whole Old Testament. They have the Bible. Let them hear it. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes from the dead, they will repent. Will they? Abraham says, no. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. So let's, let's get into our story here. This rich man is blessed, and, the, and a godly man in the eyes of this culture. It's what you need to understand. To them, how do you know, you know like, here's the question again, how do you know when a person is truly saved? Well, I don't really have an answer for that. I don't really have an answer for that. I mean, you can look at their works, but I know Christians are capable of bad things, and I know lost people are capable of good things. So how do you know? Well, ultimately, it's between them and God, and that's, that's the real answer. In their culture, they had it figured out, at least supposedly. If you were healthy, and if you were wealthy, you were going to heaven. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like a televangelist, doesn't it? <laughs> you need to understand the doctrine of the televangelist is nothing new. Nothing new. It, it's the same doctrine that the friends of Job bring to him when their friend loses everything, all of his kids, all of his wealth, and all of his health. And they come to him and says, they, they say, we know that you're a sinner. How do they know that? Because that, they read surface circumstances, life circumstances, and say, you must not be headed to heaven because if you were following God, here's their theology, you would be healthy and you would be wealthy. It is, listen to me, a demonic doctrine seated in the thoughts of men. It has nothing to do at all with the scriptures. Those who teach it and those who preach it are in danger of hell. It is a demonic doctrine. It has nothing to do with the scriptures. Because here's what the scriptures teach us, both from Job and other places, including this one. What happens to you in this life may have no relationship, may, 
I'm not saying there's 100% here. Are there, are there not things that I do that are good that can result in good in my life? Is that not true? Of course it is. Is it not true also that I can do bad things and result in bad things in my life, in, in, in this life? Of course. But it's not 100% true. And, and hear me carefully. Uh, ch- teaching from Job and from this text and from other texts. What happens to you in this life may have no relationship to how God actually feels about you or your standing and status with him. What hap- again, what happens to you in this life may have no relationship to how God actually feels about you and your standing and status with him. Case in point, Job, 40-something chapters, about a man who lost everything, and what does it say at the very first? He was God's top guy. Have you not seen my servant, Job, he says, God's the one that brings it up, to Satan. He is blameless in all things. And Satan says, no, he is. Take away his stuff, and that's the whole story. You know, Take away the stuff, and he'll curse you. And of course, God already knew that Job wouldn't do that. And I'm thinking, for if I was Job, I'd be saying, well, show him a movie or something. Give him a, there's another way to do this instead of putting me through it. But... <laughs> But, uh, and I'm, I'm currently uh, working on a book uh, to that effect off of sermons that I, that I preached several years ago in the book of Job. So incredibly important that we get the messages that come from Job. And I'm working on that, and I was going to have it out for you this year. But uh, my wife and I got ourselves in a lot of, lot of uh, craziness this year. Actually, just craziness happened, happened to us. But, but um, so, so it's delayed. But it's coming, because that's so important. Because the concepts of Job, we, we are naturally, listen, you are and I am naturally health and wealth gospel believers. We, it's, it, it, the reason why health and wealth gospel appeals to people is because that's naturally the way we think. Like I said, it's demonic, it's human, it's natural, it has nothing to do with the scriptures, it has nothing to do with the, with the theology of heaven whatsoever, it has everything to do with the theology down here. And let me, let, me, let me demonstrate this to you, as far as health and wealth goes. When something bad happens to you, what's your first thought? Unless you've been trained well and discipled well, your first thought is to say, I must have done something wrong. Isn't that right? That is scripturally inaccurate. A reality actually is something altogether different than that. And when someone else, by the way, falls on hard times or something terrible happens to them, our first thought is to think, oh, they must have done something wrong. And when someone is blessed, or we say, as we say, oh, so-and-so is blessed, and, and what does that typically mean? They got a stack of money. They live in a great place. They're able to come down to South Padre Island. <laughs> Their kids are all doing what they tell them to do. That person's blessed. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I got a guy right here in front of you who had it all, and he was definitely not blessed. It was a test, and he failed. Forever he failed. So we need to rein in our theology a little bit here. Their, their conscience, listen, the, the conclusions that they drew here were natural. It was, it was the theology of the day. It's been the theology of the day since the very beginning. Uh, it's natural. It's human-centered. Uh, and this parable is aimed at directly at that, and, most, and most, most especially directed at those who are promoting it. The health and wealth preachers of the day were the Pharisees. That's what they were. Why? Because they were wealthy, and yet they were not living for God, but they had to put it out there that God is blessing us and we have no reason to live for God because God has already marked us as his because that's what he does when he gives people wealth and gives them health. So, so this is going to turn the whole thing up on its ear. Uh, they had no concept, no concept that a rich person would go to hell. To them, that was the mark of heaven. How do we know if somebody's truly going down here? Well, we don't really know unless they got money. That's how they're for sure going to heaven. That's the way they thought. It's easier, Jesus, at the end of dealing with the rich young ruler who was, loved his money more than he loved God and wouldn't turn to God in repentance. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, and I know you've been told, some of you, that that eye of a needle was a hole in the wall in the city of Jerusalem, and it was, that's just simply not true. That, that hole in the wall was not created in the w- hole in the wall of Jerusalem was not created until 300 years after Jesus says this. So when he's talking about a needle, he's actually talking about a needle, like you know a needle. And they called that wall after Jesus says this, they begin to call it the eye of the needle because camels couldn't pass through it, but it was based upon what Jesus had already said 300 years before. So just erase that from I don't know whoever taught you that. 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they said, then who can be saved? If, if the rich aren't making it, then none of us are going to heaven. It's their concept. Like I said, they were sold on this health and wealth uh, doctrine. The Pharisees and those who followed this doctrine were this rich man. And Jesus is about to turn the whole thing up on its ear. So this is a story again of a man he thought he was going to heaven, but ended up in hell. And as I've already submitted to you, I believe this is going to be the most common experience of those who are in hell for eternity. People that are there who were convinced in this life that they certainly weren't going to go there. So, a bit scary, since I expect to go there. You expect to go there. Again, make sure your plan agrees with God. So this is a story of extreme contrast. Here's we could go a, just a, a tremendous list of what these contrasts are. I'm going to give you some of the biggies. You got a poor man who becomes rich forever. You got a rich man who becomes poor forever. You got a poor man who suffers in this life and is blessed in the next life. You got a rich man who has bountiful blessings in this life but suffers forever in the next life. You got a uh, starts with a poor man on the outside and a rich man on the inside, and it ends forever with the poor man on the inside and the rich man on the outside. You got a poor man who is in rich in immense need, a rich man with no needs, but the poor man winds up with no needs, and the rich man winds up with all of his needs, and they stay that way forever. A poor man who desires everything but has nothing, a rich man who desires nothing because he has everything. And then the whole thing flips. A poor man who spent his life being humiliated and a rich man who was exalted in this life. And then it turned out that the poor man was exalted. We're going to see how much. So, and the rich man was humiliated. Both of their conditions are forever. The poor man who seeks help and receives none. Then we have a rich man who seeks help and then he receives none. So contrasts are, boy, extreme here. The story breaks into three parts, which, by the way, are the same three parts in your life story. You know what the three parts of your story are? You live, then you die, and then you live in the next life. Which, which one? Where are you? <laughs> I'm not really sure. First of all, it begins with this guy's life, and this is an extremely wealth, extreme wealth situation. There was a certain man... And who habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, gaily living in splendor. We, again, we have a hard time interpreting this because we interpret it in the light of our culture, which in order to, clothes are, are a small thing for us. In this culture, the way they demonstrated wealth was by what they wear. In this culture, the average person may only own three or four sets, sets of clothing. That in, and when I'm a set, which means your undergarment, your your regular garment and a cloak. You may only own three or four sets of this in your entire life. The middle class person, if you will, in this culture. Why? Because it's all handmade. And the materials to make it are very expensive. And so, and most likely, by the way, most of the stuff that you're wearing in your life in the middle class culture is something someone else wore and left it to you. Brother, sister, friend, aunt, uncle, cousin, uh, they, you know, hand, hand me down culture in every way. And, but anymore in our culture, like I, I bet you can't guess how much I paid for this. <laughs> Not much. I don't pay any much for my clothes because you've got these secondhand places and you have these places like Marshall's and everything where they take these clothes that are, that don't sell name brands and my, mine costs $10, and you bought yours at Dillard's for $70, and they're the exact same shirt. What's the difference? Nothing. So there's, there's no way to know whether I have money or not based upon the way I, way I and, anymore. But in this culture, that's exactly the way you knew. Because if we were regular people, the way I would know you were regular people is because every time I saw you, you were wearing the same set of clothes. Now, you would wash them. When you washed yourself, you got undressed and you wash your clothes at the same time and uh, you put your clothes back on and both of you drip dried until things, you know, went to just the way it was. You didn't have another set to change into. And it was no big deal because that's the way it was for everybody. So it was nothing, you know, no big deal. Well, Martha, I can't believe she's wearing the same brown cloak. Well, guess what? She doesn't have one. That's all she's got. 
And by the way, you don't have another one to put on either. So the fact that this guy is in purple, oh my goodness. You talk about opulent wealth. The, 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 purple, the purple dye came from a snail in the ocean in the Mediterranean called a murex, a very small little snail. And you'd take the snail and smash it, and this little purple dye comes out of it, and they would take it, and they would stain their clothes with it. It took a lot of these, and they don't, you had to dive down to get them. You had to hunt for them. So, so to make enough dye, to accumulate enough to, to, to dye your clothes was an extremely expensive process. Uh, uh, case in point, uh, in the book of Acts, they are over in Thessalonica. They come across a lady by the name of Lydia, uh, a purveyor of purple dye, it says. But she was only selling to a certain class, the very upper class. The typical person could not buy that. It would be a small little bottle of stuff that she squeezed out of hundreds and hundreds of snails. And uh, it was uh, something that was, uh, Laodicea, was, it was a place where they produced it. So, so this rich man indulged in lavish, ostentatious, luxurious lifestyle every single day. And the culture would label him blessed by God. Certain to go to heaven. Because why? Because that's their theology. Be careful of the theology of the day. I said that in my Sunday school class. Same thing to you. It, you're in danger if you're not every day in this. You just are. The theology day is powerful. It's pervasive. It's believed by those that you trust. I'm not saying not trust those people. I'm just saying take everything with a grain of salt. Sit down in front of this. Every day. You have to be, let this stuff wash over you or you're going to be duped. And we're all duped in this room, including me. To a certain level. Anybody 100% correct theology? No, Jesus does, but we don't. And so we're asking every day that God would deliver us from those things, and, and he does. He's faithful to do that. But we have to do our part. So, so the culture bl uh, uh, labels it as blessed because that's the way they believe. It's their theology. Even though their Bible taught them differently, they have a 40-something page uh, chapter book uh, called Job. And their Bible, they already had it. It's the oldest book in the Bible, as far as written, when the time was written. And yet they, 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 they still thought somehow the, the same doctrine as the friends of Job, which was completely incorrect. Again, their prosperity gospel said that if you sinned, this wouldn't be true of you. You wouldn't have these clothes. You wouldn't have these riches. And so he must not be a sinner. That's the way they thought. The other extreme, verse 20. A certain poor man named Lazarus laid at the gate covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the man's Rich man's table, besides even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Again, this is another thing that we interpret in our culture, and we miss some of the richness of it. Um, this is an extreme situation. Extreme wealth, extreme poverty. Uh, the word here for poor literally is the Greek that means he literally had absolutely nothing. Like, just nothing. Completely nothing. Uh, extreme poverty, extreme illness. The, the, the statement there, again, one word in the Greek says laid at the gate, or two words actually, but with a, with a little prefix on it. Laid at the gate literally means that he had, it's a, it's a picture of him having to be placed there because he's incapable of getting there himself. So he, he's extremely poor and he's extremely sick. Of course, it says here he's covered with sores, but you understand he can't even get to the gate to beg himself. Someone's got to dump him there. That's really what the word says in, in the Greek. He's dumped there every day. And again, it implies he can't get there himself. And he's at extreme hunger. Verse 21 says that they, they were, he's wanting to eat the crumbs that fell from this man's table. And again, our in, the insufficiency of the English language to, to interpret the Greek and especially to interpret it and understand the Middle Eastern culture of the day. These are, we have another place where a woman, Syrophoenician woman, comes and says, you know, deliver my daughter from a demon possession. And Jesus says, why should I take the food of the children and give it to the dogs? In other words, take the message that are supposed to be to go to the Jews and give it to the Gentiles. And she says, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs underneath the tables. And she said, he says, for that answer, your request is granted. Of course, um, Jesus was testing her and also testing the people listening. But again, what do we think of when we think of crumbs? If I say a crumb, what do you think of? I think of little bitty pieces like that. And you know, you take a little piece and hand it to the dog, you know, sort of thing. Um, little pieces. Uh, that's not what this is talking about. They had no napkins. This is, uh, they have no, no paper. And you certainly wouldn't make, uh, you wouldn't turn expensive material into something you wipe your face and, and, and hands with at a supper table, uh, cloth napkins. This is, cloth is extremely expensive. So, and they had no utensils for the most part. For the most part, they ate with their hands. So what did you do with nasty hands? 
Well, it was, this is a bread culture, so they make bread every single day, and the bread that once or two or three days old, of course, as you know, if you leave it out in the open, it gets super dry, it gets brittle, it gets moldy, it gets old, whatever. They would save the old bread, cut it in slices, and they would use it the same way you would use a napkin. So on the right hand, there would be, let's just say, a pile of bread that you would eat. On your left hand would be a pile of bread that you would not eat, that you would wipe your hands with once you're finished eating this pile. That makes sense? And then you would wad it up and throw it under the table. And then after you're done, the dogs would come through and, and, and have food. Well, not even that, not even that nasty stuff is a rich man even willing to bring out to Lazarus. Because, again, they followed several lines of theology, which are demonic, which are hellish, which are straight from... Uh, our own messed up thinking, one of the, their theologies was a form of karma. A person in a condition like Lazarus is because God has cursed him, and I'm not going to interfere. Who am I to interfere with God's cursing of, of Brother Lazarus here? Because I'm not going to get away. That's complete karma. It's straight from the hot place. Uh, karma, karma, just like the prosperity gospel, is demonic in origin, and thus counter to what the Bible teaches. Uh, that we should do. He should be caring for this guy. did not, because... Because, again, he, he held to these strange theologies. So, so the first thing was their life, and now we're ready to look at their death, verse 22. So they both die. One gets carried by the angels to the Abraham's bosom. The other one, the rich man, dies and goes to a place, as it says there, called Hades. And again, this is a, he's turning it up on their ear. They would have not expected this. Had he paused even for a second, they would have said, well, of course he's died. Everybody does. And then he's going to go straight to the Abraham's bosom. And then Jesus flips the whole story on them and tells them, no, the poor man goes there, and the rich man goes to a place of torment, and they would have been, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But when Jesus says this, it's the last thing they would have thought would happen. It's the last thing. Abraham's bosom refers to a place where he was seated. Now, again, our culture keeps us from understanding what that means. First of all, understand, in their culture, there were no chairs. You ate on the floor. This is an Eastern culture, uh, much closer related to Chinese, uh, Japanese, Korean, we talked last time, you don't wear your shoes in the house, you washed your feet before you entered the house, their floor would have been as clean as your table. For you to walk in their house with shoes on would be like me coming into your house and standing with my shoes on top of your dining room table. It would be offensive if you didn't do that. They also, they reclined when they ate. So when it says that they, he was at Abraham's bosom, what it means is that I, I don't know if I want to lay down here up here or not, I don't think y'all can see me. Who can get up and down easily? Anybody here that's got real ambulatory? <laughs> Paul, you, can you? Who's? Come on. All right, so you stand right there. Face everybody. My friend and I are going to eat lunch together. The table is about two inches off the ground. So how are we going to get down to it? Well, you can squat, but you know, where legs were out. So what you do is you lay on your left side. You, wait, you lay on your left side because, and you eat with your right hand because there's something you do with your left hand that you don't want to eat with. Like I said, they didn't have paper. I mean, under any circumstances. Under any circumstances. They didn't have hand gel to clean up afterwards or none of that. So, you know, I'm not saying the hand wasn't clean necessarily. I'm just saying in the culture that it was understood that that hand was for certain things and this hand was for other things. So, so here's what we're going to do. So the table's right here. We would go down like this. Come on. <laughs> and we would lay like this. You right there? Yep. Hey, we're we're going to spoon. <laughs> the table's here in front of us. We would eat with our right hand. We would talk to everybody. He would eat with his right hand. Notice where he is. Right here in my bosom, you see. <laughs> what a sweetie. <laughs> and of course, we'd be like cordwood stacked around the whole table just like that. So you see, that's, that's the way when it says Jesus was reclining at the table. They didn't have like recliners. They were not going about this way. They were going this way. And they'd be laying on the left side, eating with the right hand. And then based upon where you were in reference to the head, of, or I'm sorry, to the guest of honor. In this case, the guest of honor is Abraham. So the closest you are to Abraham, the closer you are to Abraham as far as the way they're stacked around the table is the higher you are in rank. So Abraham's number one. Of course, he's the guest of honor. He's the father of the Jews. He's the father of the faithful. He's, he's the man of faith, right? He's the father of all of us who believe. He's an awesome guy in every way. Um, so, so the closer you are to leaning back against Abraham, the higher rank you are. That's why Jesus, we're going to look at a parable, I believe it's next week, 
uh, where, where Jesus comes in, everybody's jockeying for position at the table. Because where you sat was determining of the esteem that you received from the group there. So immediately when I walk in and Abraham's laying there and Lazarus is laying in his bosom, I automatically know Lazarus is, phew, he's way up there. So it's not just that Lazarus goes to heaven. It's that Lazarus is the last, has become the first. Of course, you can't get Abraham's spot, but you can get the next spot. And, and it would trail down, you know, the 30th spot down is the least that, you know, Jesus says, go to the least spot so that if the host comes in and sees you in the least spot, and says, oh, no, no, come up here, then, then he takes you from the 30th spot and he puts you in the fourth spot. I guess what happens to the guy who's in the fourth spot who maybe should have been in the fifth spot, but he got in the fourth spot. He gets bumped to the... 30th spot. And so for the rest of the meal, it's kind of like, mm-mm-mm. He says, heaven's going to be like that. So, wow. Some great information there. So, so Abraham's bosom, he's not just doing okay. He's not just making it into heaven. He's doing awesome. And his condition is forever. Forever. Just like, just like the, poor, the rich man's. It's, it's a forever condition. The rich man, it says, is in Hades, and I notice they're both kind of in the same spots here because they're able to talk to each other, able to see to each other, see each other. This is a special condition that was true prior to Jesus' death, burial, and ultimately resurrection. Prior to Jesus' resurrection, prior to the coming of the Holy Spirit in the church, there was a time in which the people, when they died, all went to the same place, as in this case here. But there was a place of torment sectioned off from a place of blessing. Notice Abraham is in this spot as well. By the way, it was all considered to be geocentric down there, Hades. Uh, Sheol in the, in the Hebrew, Hades in the Greek, it was all considered to be down there. Uh, as an example, uh, Saul goes looking at the witch at Endor and wants to call up uh, Samuel. Where does Samuel, Samuel come from? He says he comes up from where? From the ground. I thought Samuel was saved. He is. But they were held in a holding place, an area of bliss, until the one who would come to ultimately pay for all their sins. Then it says Jesus led captivity captive. It tells us that in Ephesians chapter 4. It says that in 1 Peter. He takes, takes everyone up. So now when a person who, is, who belongs to God, who belongs to Christ, when they die, they go straight to be with him. But lost people, nothing has changed for them. The experience that they have is the same as, as this rich man has. There is no, nothing has changed for them. So notice something else here. So the same torment awaits those. Who, are, who die outside of Christ. We've got, we got to get this, guys. I'm not trying to scare you about your own salvation unless it's necessary. But I am trying to scare you about those who you know who do not have. Have you spoken to them? Hell's a real place. Jesus is pulling no punches here. Telling us like it is. It says, behold, he lifted up his eyes. I don't know, have you heard the, the, the trend today? It's called being woke. Heard that? That's exactly what he is here. This is the real woke, by the way. In our culture, it means that you think that socialism works, which I'm thinking, you're the most asleep I've ever known anybody to ever be. You're dreaming a pipe dream and thinking socialism. Haven't we tried this out a hundred times and it all went down the toilet? I don't know where these people are. They are definitely uh, not woke. But this guy is. He's as woke as he can possibly be. Notice he's total self-realization. There is no soul sleep here, not for him or Lazarus. They're com completely, all their senses, both of them. One experiencing the bliss, the other one experiencing the torment, and there is no remediation, there is no, nothing changes. Nothing changes. So the saved immediately is conscious in conscious bliss and fellowship. The unsaved is immediately in conscious torment, immediately. Verse 24, notice he calls him Father. Father Abraham. Father Abraham, send Lazarus down here. So he's a Jew. Aren't all Jews saved? They thought they were. Aren't all Baptists saved? Some think they are just because they are. Aren't all those who believe in God and are sincere, aren't they saved? Like I said, you got a plan to go to heaven and disagree with God's plan? You're not going. You're not going. You must have, listen, a personal encounter with the Savior whose name is Jesus where you trust your eternity to him. Have you had that experience? Yes. You have to have that experience. There's no getting around that. Have mercy on me. It's very interesting. Have mercy on me, Father Abraham. It's amazing. He's merciless one on the earth, but he wants mercy there. 
So again, I notice everything shifts. He turns into a person who understands the needs for all these things, but it's too late. And he, he, he still is that. He understands all that. He doesn't, he doesn't go into oblivion. No, he, he goes into complete consciousness, and it never changes. So verse 25 and 26, there's no mention here, by the way, of, of rescue of any kind. So Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you were received good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he's being comforted here, and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, in order that those who wish to come over from, where, from here to you are not able, and that none may cross over from there to us. So notice, it's a fixture. Eternity is a place where things are completely fixed. This is the only place where things are not. This is the only place where we've got a choice. You're not going to have a choice there. Neither heaven nor hell are going to be places of choices. And, and, and I, don't, I don't mean that it's going to be a blissful place, but you're not going to be able to alter your situation. For those who are going to heaven, that's great. By the way, I didn't know if you know this. I wrote a book called The Can the Say Be Lost, and I'll give you the answer so you don't have to buy the book. The answer is no. No, the saved can't be lost if they're truly saved. It's just impossible. They couldn't save themselves by being good. How can they unsave themselves by being bad? It makes no sense. But it's not a logic thing. It's a biblical thing. And therefore, you ought to buy the book because there is a better. <laughs> and if you can't buy it, you can't afford it, just take one. I don't care. Just we need the, the, the stuff has got to get out there. So, so, where am I here? Oh, there I am. So, so hell, notice, he, he, there's no repentance in his language. There's no, I'm so sorry for what I did, please send Lazarus. doesn't say that. Why not? Doesn't he know he does, he's done wrong? Certainly does. But I, I want to underscore this. There is, hell is not remedial. You don't, you don't it's not a, pur, don't, I know some of us were raised with a purgatory theology. Purgatory is not in the scriptures. There's no purgatory. There's no paying things off. There's no getting better. Hell is not a place where you get better. Hell is a place, listen, where what you were in this life, which is evil and outside of Christ, is crystallized forever. Not only is it not remedial, it's also without mitigation. Forever. It's a place, as I said before, where a suffer, you suffer so profoundly that a tiniest drop of water means every, could mean everything for you. What's that like? You had no concept. You enjoyed all the providences of God, but you didn't love him and thank him in return. What does it tell us in the scriptures? The kindness of God leads us to what? Repentance. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 2. The kindness of God is intended to lead us to repentance, that you've got all this stuff. You need to sit back and say, wait a minute, but I'm not a good person. And I, my life doesn't agree with what the scriptures say, and yet God is being so kind to me. I need to throw myself on his mercy. Look how his kindness, maybe he will be kind to me in forgiving me for the sinner that I am. And again, why is God being kind to you? So that he can lead to repentance. So that he can get you there, because we, we certainly need it. There's the second rich man in this story, by the way. There's two rich men in this story. We know Lazarus isn't. And, of course, the rich man who was rich in that life and ceased to be rich in the next life. But there's a, th there's a second rich man in this story. Who is it? See him? Abraham. And by the way, what, more wealthy than the other dude, I would submit to you. Abraham. So notice, it's not a matter of riches. It's not a matter of, okay, well, now that we know the riches are, you know, we're going to send us all to hell, so let's get rid of all our riches. That's what Pastor Bill is teaching. And if you want to give me all your money, that's fine. But, <laughs> but I'm, afraid, I'm afraid that if you interpret, you know, again, what, what are riches? They're just simply tests in this life because they mean nothing. It's just monopoly money. It can all be rounded up at the end, go back in the box, you lose it all. It's just a test. So are you, how are you doing with the test? It, 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 again, he, this rich man didn't pass. The test was God's blessing you even though you're evil and you don't see it as God being kind to you and, and come and humble yourself and, and repent. So that's all riches are. It's just a test. It just makes you more what you already are. That's all it does. It just accentuates your personality. That's all it does. So they're a great gulf. So both situations are permanent. There's those in hell are never going to get to heaven, and vice versa. It's fixed. There's no second chances. There's no relief, and there's no hope. Verse 27. He's concerned about his brothers. So send my brothers. He said to them, I beg you then, Father, send him to my father's house. Send Lazarus. And I have five brothers that, they may warn, that he may warn them lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Every single Saturday, they're reading from the Bible in the synagogues. 
If they'll listen to that, they won't be in this place. How true. Said him, no, Father, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Now, let's stop right there for just a second. Because I think we need to hammer this one down. Don't you agree with him? Isn't there a part of you that says, that asks the question, if God just would pull out the, all the stops and perform some global miracles, everybody would get saved? Why does the scripture say God wants to save everyone and wants no one to come everyone to come to repentance and none to perish. Well, then why doesn't he do everything he can to reach them? Isn't there a part of you that asks that question? That question is answered right here, by the way. Abraham gives it. He lays it down right here on him, and, he, and we need to have it laid down on us. Uh, and let me just start off by, I mean, isn't, isn't there, haven't you come across people that say, if God would only heal my loved one, I would believe in him? Hmm? If God would change my marriage or my circumstances, I would get saved. I would go to church. I would believe in him. I would believe there is a God. Haven't you heard those things? And let me just say this from the scriptures. No, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. If they won't believe the word of God, they will not believe, even if someone rises from the dead, even if the greatest miracles are performed in front of them. They would not. Not only do the scriptures teach that very clearly, but history demonstrates that very clearly. Just show you. Well, here, let me just underscore this. The greatest evidence of the reality of God is his word. This, the greatest reality, the greatest evidence of the reality of God on our planet today is his word ahead of all of his creation and any miracles. Because here, here's what I know. We've had a ton of miracles performed in front of us over the centuries. And the creation, by the way, is going in front of us every single day. Is it changing anyone's hearts? Hardly ever. No, I can't say never, because there's a lot of people who just start coming to grips. I've got a deacon in my church who just was raised a Catholic, decided he didn't believe in God, and, and, but because of what he saw in creation and, and what he studied in biology, he was just like, there has to be a God. And he started from that, started his steps towards coming to faith in Christ. And anyway, so I'm not saying never, I'm just saying hardly ever do you see people walking down the aisle because they saw a sunrise. They should, shouldn't they? Isn't that true? Can't you as a Christian say, isn't that awesome? Look what God has done. How it melts your heart and makes your, your time of worship and, uh, and with him just so great, especially the, the weather that we're having. I mean, wow. The greatest evidence of the reality of God is his word. So some may be tempted to think otherwise, and, and I, I want to help you with that. Some may say, well, if God would just pull out a global miracle, everybody would be saved. And again, I said, no, they won't. No, they won't, because history and scriptures demonstrate that they would not. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, Paul speaking of the condition of the Jews as they went through the wilderness, of all the things that they saw. Our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea under the cloud. By, by day, God would overshadow them with this cloud, so they kind of walked under this umbrella through this trackless wilderness, super hot. And at night, this, this, this cloud would be a pillar of fire, so they would just basically have a nightlight to walk by all night long as they were traveling through the wilderness. Then it says they all passed through the sea. In a boat? No, what'd they do? They walked through on dry land. Now, guys, that's a miracle. And by the way, they just came out from Egypt where they saw ten miracles of where God separated from the Jews from the Egyptians and basically plundered the whole Egyptian nation. Greatest nation there was in the, in the world at that time. They'd seen it. Then it also goes on to say, and they, 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 went, they ate from the same spiritual food every day in the morning. They would walk out and there would be manna laying on the ground. Quail would come in in the evenings, right? They all drank the same spiritual drink, drinking it from the same spiritual rock. Moses strikes the rock, remember? Water doesn't come from rocks. Water comes from the ground. But somehow this rock produced water. And, and remember, there's several million people, plus goats, chickens, goldfish, and ducks, they had to water all of them. So it wasn't just a little water coming out. It was a massive amount of water. It wasn't just a creek. We're talking about a, an incredible river. All the miracles that they saw, all the things that should have filled their head, if anyone should have been converted, it should have been them. What does it, did it work? For the most part, no. 100% of the men over 30 died in the wilderness because even with all that, they would not believe God to go into the promised land. E Kind of throws out the window our whole thing. If God would pull out global miracles, people would be saved. No, they won't. 
If they won't believe what he says, they won't believe what he does. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they laid low in the wilderness. He had to kill them all. He had to kill a large portion of them. So, so again, this is a culture that believed those things. So God just does miracles, people are saved. Uh, if people are rich, then, then God has blessed them. And no, it's not true. The greatest, listen, the, again, the greatest evidence of the reality of God in our culture, in our world, has ever been, is his word. Hebrews 4.12, there's nothing more powerful than this. That's not 4.12. I'm not sure what that is. Will they perform yet? Oh, this is, this is something else, but it's great. I, I don't know where it is, but there's 4.12. <laughs> Hebrews 4.12. <laughs> For the word of God, this is stronger than miracles. You want miracles to happen, you've already got something stronger that you can give them. The word of God is living and active. So it's not like a miracle. A miracle happens in a point of time, and then you give me a week or a year or a month or 10 years, we start forgetting about it. Word of God's not like that. Word of God's consistent. It's, it's contemporary. It's staying with you. It's talking to you. It's speaking to you. It's working on you. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both of joints and marrow able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Oh, wow, that's why people don't read it. They don't like heart surgery. This is the most powerful thing out there. Hear what Abraham has to say. No, they will not believe even if one rises from the dead. Do you believe Abraham? I believe him. I believe the word of God. If they don't believe the word of God, there is nothing you can do for them. They'll either take God at his word or they will not have him at all. I, 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 I believe history, like I said, and, and especially uh, the Word itself supports that. The Word of God is sufficient. It is. Again, Abraham says, but, but he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. So what does that tell us? What do we need to do? So not, not pray to God for miracles. Now, I'm, I shouldn't say that. There's nothing wrong with praying to God that God will work a miracle. Nothing wrong with that. But he's going to either do it or he won't do it. There's no way to hold him down to it. He chooses to do what he, what he does. But, the, but most, most, the, the greatest miracle working of God that's happening in our, in our world today is the word of God going out. So what do we need to be doing? I mean, if, you thought, if miracles truly would save people and there was going to be a miracle happening down here on the corner of 1st and, and, and 10th Street, wouldn't you call all your friends and get them to go over there? All the lost ones for sure and all your family. I just want you to see what God's going to do. Wouldn't you? Again, hear Abraham. Hear the Bible that says the word of God is more powerful than that. So shouldn't you get, be getting them to the place where they're hearing this? Teaching them this? Handing them this? Shouldn't you be blogging about this on the internet? Shouldn't you be talking about this as you uh, go about your life? Yeah, because this is the stuff. This is the stuff that's doing the work. It's what changed you, it's what brought you to Christ. I didn't see any miracles, but I became convicted by what I read in the scriptures. And by the way, I, I was saved when I was eight years old, but I was raised in a house where the scriptures were exalted and where they were taught in good Bible teaching churches. And I had heard them a million times by the time I was eight. Never, never heard them though. But one time I got in there and the <laughs> a switch was flipped for me. And eight years old, I don't know how many sins I'd committed, but I knew that I was a sinner hell bound, and I believed what God said about me. I humbled myself, repented, and accepted Christ, and because the work of the work of the word, there were no miracles in front of me. I I don't, you know, I don't think people need miracles. God can do miracles, and obviously people were saved, and their people lives are changed because of miracles. It brought them to the place, but but it's it's not like the word. It's not like the word. If I find it interesting, Paul goes to places, Peter goes to places, and they don't just start performing miracles. Miracles happen at times, but they're, they're sort of, um, for, for lack of a better term, sideshow. They're sort of, they happen in progress of them actually preaching the word to people. So God decides that there needs to be a miracle in that place, and that's awesome. And that's God's decision. But, but their job was not to perform miracles. Their job was to get the word out, and God wants to choose to perform miracles through them or under those circumstances, and great. God just, God just wants to add that, and that's, but it's sort of like uh, 
you know, sort of like seasoning the main courses of the Word. So we'll stop right there. Okay, let's pray, and uh, we'll roll out of here. Thank you, God, so much for teaching us. Thank you for your Word. God, we confess our, um, our lack our lack of ability to understand and interpret correctly, and that we are totally dependent upon your Holy Spirit to, uh, as our teacher, um, enabling us to put together these great themes, these incredible lines, and and understand, Lord, uh, through things that can seem confusing. Lord, we know that there's a path through this, and um, we're asking you to direct our path, and we take our position as sheep, and we let you be the shepherd. Uh, in all areas of our life. Thank you, God, for speaking to us. Turn our hearts, God, toward those who do not know you, and turn our hearts, God, um, concerned about those who are not reconciled with you. Change us, God. Help us to see them for what they are, the way you see them, and help us to get desperate for them, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.